obviously this video was specific to chicken nuggets and Jamie Oliver, but it points out a rhetoric that we see all across the board when it comes to promoting or devaluing food choices. Hello YouTube friends, today I'm reacting to another video, this one about Jamie Oliver and school lunches. So let's dive in. Jamie Oliver has an interesting relationship with chicken nuggets, and it's something I find deeply fascinating because it's this weird convergence of both an extremely political rhetoric and one man's personal pride. It's a conflict that has led the man to take on chicken nuggets in some form in every show he's made, to flex over them and display superiority right down to basically lying, like in the 2011 miniseries Jamie's Dream School, where he promises a room full of troubled teens that he can teach them to make nuggets better, cheaper, and faster than frozen nuggets. And this is £1.90, it's 10 pence cheaper, I'm going to do it in half the amount of time, and this is, do you think this is better for you, or that? No, I don't. All the way back in 2005, on the show Jamie's School Dinners, Jamie demonstrated the contents and production of chicken nuggets for a group of children, which is, as with a lot of food, kind of gross. These are the kids that won't eat my chicken. You know, these are the kids that want their, 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 their nuggets back. So I want to show them what's in their nuggets. Then what they do is they add... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh my gosh, like, if kids are eating food because they like it, yes, they might be grossed out because of what, like, how it's made, but that's always a thing. Like, when you're a kid, you don't even recognize that chicken that you actually, like, eat in your food is the same as the animal you learned about. And so, okay, oh my gosh, funny thing that happened the other week, we were celebrating my daughter's birthday with a friend of ours who has a son with a very close birthday. So we just did the birthday parties together and I made them both animal cakes that they could smash into and he likes chickens. So his was a chicken and it looked apparently too realistic for him to feel comfortable eating. But that's completely normal. And he just kept saying like, but bug, bug, like I can't eat this. At any rate, yes, things like bone can get into your food, but it's actually really nutritious because it's full of minerals and things that your own bones need. So trying to gross out kids by showing them how things are made is honestly just a really manipulative and dirty tactic and not actually a reflection of nutrition because culturally we have things that we are sort of predetermined to think are disgusting and one of those things for example in our society would be bugs bugs are really gross if you think about eating them in our culture but they're actually extremely nutritious so there's that balance where just because you're grossed out by something doesn't mean it's not good for you. Or chicken skin. That is how that part is made. At the end, he asks if any of the kids still want nuggets and all of them decline. Any, anyone want of these? No. Uh, no. In 2010, on the show Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution, the production recreated the scenario with kids from Huntington, West Virginia, but this time when Jamie asks if they still want the nuggets after learning how they're made, all the kids say yes. Now, who would still eat this? They all want those nugs. And who can blame them? Chicken nuggets are delicious. Okay, I feel like that's also Oh my goodness, it's just so manipulative and his tactic of having all these kids together, they're going to react based on their peers like, oh my goodness, are you horrified about this too? Should I also not be eating these chicken nuggets? And that's just so shady. Like, I don't know why he has this particular vendetta against chicken nuggets, but I feel like it's really horrible to just try to gross a kid out of eating something that actually provides them some decent nutrition. 
Jamie's argument against chicken nuggets is just so comically bad. There's a lot of possible arguments against chicken nuggets, a lot of reasons you can consider chicken nuggets to be bad, and Jamie is making none of them. For example, you can argue that chicken nuggets are a product of a corrupt industry that is often deeply inhumane towards the animals that pass through it, making it immoral to enjoy the products of that inhumanity. Or you can argue that eating meat is intrinsically immoral, that we have, for the most part, moved past the need to get sustenance at the expense of animals. You can argue that the meat industry is exploitative of its workers at the mundane end merely engaging in aggressive anti-union practices and predatory hiring of migrant workers who can then be threatened with punitive use of the immigration system, and at the extreme end, buying slaves from Christian drug rehab programs. But Jamie's argument- Oh my gosh, I haven't heard of that last one. But having visited plants, like, it is not an ideal situation for workers at all. And I do feel like he's making very valid arguments against chicken nuggets or even the meat industry at large through these things. I'm really interested in hearing what Jamie's argument is, so. And against chicken nuggets is that they're bad because they're made from the bad parts of the bird, arguing that there are the good, clean parts of the chicken that are appropriate to eat, and the rest of the bird, which is garbage. Take this bit, for example, which uses the grammar of television to suggest that even- Okay, that seriously makes no sense. Because, first of all, dichotomizing your food into good and bad really doesn't benefit anyone. and. I go into that more in another video, which we'll link at the end if you're interested. But having certain parts of the chicken be good and bad really doesn't make much sense at all. Because if you're going to eat something like a chicken, all of its parts have been made from the same nutrients that your body needs. And different parts of it utilize different minerals and nutrients that your body needs. So. Theoretically, you'd want to be eating like as much of that thing as you could if you're wanting to get as many nutrients out of it as you can. That being said, I would never eat the feathers or the beak or the eyes. But like, that's me. And just as an argument, it really doesn't make sense that parts of the chicken are good and parts of it aren't. Now, chicken wings are worth quite a lot of money. I showed them where all the nice cuts of meat came off the chicken. So we just pop the legs off and then you're left with a carcass with all the ribs and the little bits of giblets and blood and skin and stuff like that. What do you think happens to this? They get thrown away. He'll have people sniff store-bought chicken nuggets and ask weird leading questions like, doesn't this smell dirty? But then no one ever responds because it probably just smells like a chicken nugget. Now smell your nugget and then smell the other one. Your, your one should sort of smell quite clean. Our smell yeah. smells fresh. And then the other one smells a bit dirty. Okay. What? <laughs> like, this one smells clean and this one smells a bit dirty. Like, what? Oh my gosh. Chicken doesn't smell clean or dirty. It smells like chicken. How would you even define smelling clean? or smelling dirty, like, what? The process involves taking the parts of the carcass that aren't prime cuts of meat, parts that still have a lot of good muscle tissue attached, a lot of connective tissue and gristle, which aren't very tasty, but contain collagen and elastin, which breaks down into useful amino acids, leftover skin removed from cuts that are sold skinless, organs and bone marrow, grinding that into a paste, straining out larger solids, then using the resulting meat goo as an ingredient in food like chicken nuggets. And you know what? I will concede this fact. The stuff looks gross. Yes, the stuff looks gross, but it's also the most practical application of using as much of the bird as you can, which I think is a very lofty goal because people eat chicken. If everyone were vegan, then this wouldn't be an argument. But like, people eat chicken. If you're wanting to minimize the downsides to that, then you should be using as much of the bird as possible. 
that's just common sense. And yes, it looks gross, but that's the mechanical alternative to manually, manually separating and finding uses for every distinct little part of the bird. I think it's actually brilliant, but then again, I'm a food scientist, so. But so what? Lots of food looks gross when it's raw or partially cooked. Right? Like, I would never eat raw chicken breast, regardless of how prime that is. It looks gross to me. It feels gross to me. That's just how food is. But what you can't really argue about the meat industry, and chicken nuggets in specific, is that they're wasteful. And this is something of a complexity of the issue. They definitely use all of the bird. Now, make no mistake, this frugality is in no way motivated by an ideological aversion to waste, but rather stems from maximizing the return on their product. Literally anything left over at the end of the process, they're going to try to find someone to sell it to. Mineral solids contain keratin and calcium, so dry it out, grind it up, and mix it with fertilizer. Organ proteins are used in pet food. Various soft proteins, fats, hair, hide, feathers, and other byproducts can be rendered into glycerin, gelatin, oils, lubricants, and pastes, which are used in food, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, and industrial applications. It is notoriously difficult to go truly 100% vegan because products often contain other products that are themselves made in part with animal products which is complicated because if you're going to accept that it's okay to eat animals and use animal products, which at the moment is the mainstream opinion in our society, then clearly if you're going to use the bird at all, you should use the whole bird. Now, while pink yes, goo isn't the is apocalyptic saying. nutrient void that Jamie Oliver wants to paint it as, it is undeniably the lower quality stuff. I don't want to mislead you into thinking that frozen nuggets are something that they aren't. They're not great, but you already knew that. But like, it's not sawdust, it's still food. After taking the prime cuts off a bird, there's a lot of second rate but usable nutrients left on and in the bones. This is why it was customary in ye olden days that after you ate all the easy parts off a roast chicken, you'd boil the scraps and bones to pull out whatever was left and create chicken stock. At yes. least. I literally just did that with a rotisserie chicken the other day. It's an absolutely brilliant way to utilize as much of the bird as possible and waste as little as possible. Regardless of what the industry's motives are, of course they're driven by profit, no duh, but the end result is the same where they're using as much as possible, which is actually a pretty good goal, even if you're just morally driven to not waste the bird. Now, I don't want to suggest that Jamie Oliver is classist. I don't know the secrets that lay in the inner cloisters of his heart, but these arguments definitely are. Oliver isn't arguing against nuggets because of what they contain or because they tie into complicated questions of morality and the ethics of eating meat, or even entirely because of their actual nutritional value. More on that later, but because of what they represent, which is a low-class diet. This is the language being evoked, the implication that low-class people are dirty and thus cheap and dirty are synonymous. There's bits on it that are worth lots of money. The breasts are the most expensive part. It's the biggest and it's the- His entire view seems to be based on how much each part of the bird is worth. Doesn't seem like a valid argument for whether you should eat the rest of it or not. The other thing that I want to talk about briefly is the rhetorical function of this clip. Something fascinating about it is that from the point of view of the production, from the messaging viewpoint, there really isn't a wrong answer to Jamie's offer of nuggets. Meaning that no matter what answer the kids give, I, as the conceptual author of the show, can use it. I can use the whole bird. If the kids reject the processed nuggets, they validate the assertion that nuggets aren't just low-quality cheap food made from leftovers, but are dirty and inedible. 
if the kids still want the nuggets, even knowing that before being cooked they were a pink slime, then that validates Jamie's superiority. The assertion that America is doomed, that the kids are broken, that there is a spiritual epidemic. And that is exactly how it's employed in the actual episode. I mean, what's scary is that we've brainwashed our kids so brilliantly, so even though they know something is disgusting and gross, they'll still eat it if it's in that friendly little shape. As a fascinating extension... Brainwashed? What? Like... I'm sorry. What? I would really like a greater explanation from Jamie Oliver on how we've brainwashed our kids into eating something that they've seen how disgusting it is before it's been cooked. Like, I'm sorry, but that's not brainwashing. As it makes its rounds through mimetic cycles, alternates how it's being employed based on what community it's passing through. It is shared in equal measure by people laughing at Jamie Oliver getting dunked on by some kids who want them saucy nugs, and people who agree with Jamie that this reflects a metaphysical illness in society, which is the source of the physical illness of obesity. Now this argument is stupid, but it's also extremely popular. There is a pervasive belief in our society that poorness is a moral failing that the poor inflict on themselves, that the disastrous and growing class divides in the world are the result of a type of person who just loves chicken nuggets so much that they're not willing to stop being poor. Of course, that's all extremely wrong. The real answers are far more complex. School lunches suck because there's no money for quality ingredients. The staff are often poorly trained, if not unqualified, because there's no money for training or hiring qualified personnel. There's no money for hiring qualified personnel because of a belief that school lunch lady is a meaningless trivial job where you slop food at children and not a position where you're expected to serve food to several hundred people in a mere 45 minutes. The logistics don't magically get easier just because the patrons aren't old enough to buy cigarettes. There's no money for quality food because there's no political will to allocate that money and there's no political will because of all sorts of messed up priorities, including the belief that poorness is a self-inflicted problem. Why, that sounds like a vicious cycle, doesn't it? You could address this complexity, and in fairness, Jamie Oliver hasn't strictly ignored this, even as he's drafted lunch menus that would drain an entire year's budget in a month, but it's a lot easier to look at chicken nuggets as a thing that just happens to be in proximity to the problem and blame it for everything. Back to Jamie's dream school, <laughs> Oliver promises that he can make nuggets cheaper, faster, and better than the store-bought nuggets, and it ends up exposing a lot of the charade. And this is £1.90. It's 10 pence cheaper. I'm going to do it in half the amount of time. And this is, do you think this is better for you or that? Oh, no. Now, to a degree, he's not strictly lying. If you have a very well laid out kitchen, all of the ingredients, a familiarity with the recipe, and confidence in your tools and technique, then measuring from the moment you start to when you start eating, you can probably make fried chicken strips faster than an oven can heat up a box of tenders. And the recipe he gives here, I mean, it's lightly seasoned fried chicken. Probably tastier than most nuggets as long as you make it right. And you know what? It might even cost you less by weight than the most expensive box of chicken in the grocery. More than twice as much as the cheap box though, just for the chicken breast, not including the other ingredients. Also, this isn't really that much healthier. It's still got plenty of salt. It's still fried in oil. No, it really isn't much healthier. And of course, Jamie Oliver doesn't have any studies to back up that claim, but it's also extremely impractical to expect something like that to be able to be served in a school lunch. Because if you just saw the effort that he went through between the two varieties of chicken nuggets that he just prepared, that's not something you can expect a school lunch lady to do to serve hundreds of students in a 45 minute period. That just, there are just physical time constraints that don't allow that to be practical. I'm wondering also if part of the argument is against having it be frozen 
because you could in theory manufacture premium nuggets and then freeze them and have them be more accessible for schools but again that doesn't change the cost difference so but also healthy versus unhealthy is really a terrible way of conceptualizing food in the first place this is actually a persistent problem with Oliver's version of healthy eating, which really isn't driven by actual nutritional value. He still uses a lot of sugar and salt, but is better conceptualized again as clean versus dirty. Things with lots of listed ingredients are bad. Things with fewer ingredients are good, regardless. Which makes no sense. I know that's a common argument, but it makes sense no sense there's no such thing as clean or dirty eating unless you refuse to wash your produce like that is seriously the only context where clean eating or dirty eating makes any sort of logic a longer ingredients list totally depends on what ingredients you're including in your food Lots of foods are sort of nuanced. You've got all sorts of ingredients in there that are going to serve different purposes. But most people don't even understand what each ingredient's purpose is in the food. What function it actually serves in your end product. And what the nutrition of each ingredient actually is. You would have to analyze every single one in order to determine if oh, this long list of ingredients is actually not great. That's like saying you're eating better if you're only eating like three different things. If you start eating like 20 different things, oh my gosh, you have eaten way too much and that's dirty. Like it really doesn't make any sense because actually we're wanting more variety in our diets and more ingredients signifies a greater variety. If you have a food that has a long ingredient list, you can't define its value based on the length of the list. You have to define its value based on the quality of those ingredients. 6, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 40, 44. Okay. <laughs> So the argument that I'm hearing here is if it's making you count that high, it's got to be bad for you because having to think that hard about how many ingredients are in your food, I mean, that's just going to shoot your brain. So he's not lying, but the whole exercise requires so many caveats and so much deck stacking that it is disingenuous. It's just an extension of the argument that poorness is the result of things like food choices rather than food choices being largely dictated by being poor. I mean, one, you're probably not buying the $16 box, you're buying the $7 box, and you're not coming home and heating up $2 worth of mechanically reclaimed chicken strips because everything else in your life is going great. The biggest hole in all of it, of course, is the issue of time. With the stacked deck, the linear time is about comparable, but what's not comparable at all is the actual amount of work. I mean, it, it's so self-evident that I, I feel insane even pointing it out. Jamie's fried chicken bites are good, but you spend the entire time making fried chicken. Plus, it generates a huge amount of mess that you will then need to clean up. Food prep is extremely time and energy intensive, and it's maddening that so much of the hay about healthy eating relies on pretending that it's not. Yes, and prepackaged foods like this are such a lifesaver for people who work all day and need to come home and put food on the table for their children. It's not practical for everyone to be able to spend the time required to make and clean up after preparing nutritious meals. And yes, that's something that would be amazing if everyone could do, but getting some food on the table that provides valuable calories and nutrients for your kids, 
that's valuable too. And I think there really is an issue in dichotomizing foods like this because not just because of what it does to your own psyche of like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna judge and criticize and overthink all of my food decisions from now on based on what's good and bad, but it also belittles other people and the choices that they have to make because of the situations they are in. I think it's really unfair to them as well to criticize their food choices based on what is practical in their life. An argument that displays such a fundamental lack of understanding about why people eat what they do, and it's a dangerous argument because, again, it's a popular argument, and it's popular with the kind of people who write and pass laws. Seemingly every day there's another proposal for a law to heavily tax unhealthy food or arbitrarily remove things like soda, french fries, and chicken nuggets from the already asinine list of things food assistance can and can't be spent on. Food is an almost unfathomably complex subject, and there are very real issues of public health and ecology tied up in it. People, broadly, eat what they have access to, and access is dictated by class, and class in our society is so very often dictated by race. It's about free time, stress, how far away you live from a grocery store, whether or not you live in a neighborhood where the freshest vegetable is the lettuce in a Big Mac. It connects to problems with jobs, wages, the physical design of our cities, the priorities of our politicians, and the incentives of our economic system. It's a big, intensely complex problem, which is why it's ultimately a lot easier to just be a stooge, to go on TV and blame the audience for having bad taste. Like, no, you're making the nuggets wrong. You're making dirty nuggets. Stop making dirty nuggets. I think he said it better in his conclusion than I can, but food is incredibly nuanced and we need to give it that space to be nuanced, not just for ourselves, but also for all the people in society with us. Gosh, I know this was just about Jamie Oliver and chicken nuggets, but it's really everywhere. So, so thank you for making this video. I really appreciated it, Dan Olson, and we'll see you next time.